The idea of justice occupies center stage both in ethics and in legal and political philosophy. We apply it to individual actions, to laws, and to public policies, and we think that in each case, that if they are unjust, this is a strong, maybe even conclusive, reason to reject them. Classically, justice was counted as one of the four cardinal virtues, and sometimes as the most important of the four. In modern times, John Rawls famously described it as the first virtue of social institutions. We might debate which of these realms of practical philosophy has first claim on justice. Is it first and foremost a property of law, for example, and only derivatively a property of individuals and other institutions? But it is probably more enlightening to accept that the idea has over time sunk deep roots in each of these domains, and to try to make sense of such a wide-ranging concept by identifying elements that are present whenever justice is invoked, but also examining the different forms it takes in various practical contexts. This article aims to provide a general map of the ways in which justice has been understood by philosophers past and present. We begin by identifying four core features that distinguish justice from other moral and political ideas. We then examine some major conceptual contrasts between conservative and ideal justice, between corrective and distributive justice, between procedural and substantive justice, and between comparative and non-comparative justice. Next, we turn to questions of scope. To who or what the principles of justice apply? We ask whether non-human animals can be subjects of justice whether justice applies only between people who already stand in a particular kind of relationship to one another, and whether individual people can continue to have duties of justice once justice-based institutions have been created. We then examine three overarching theories that might serve to unify the different forms of justice, utilitarianism, contractarianism, and egalitarianism. But it seems, in conclusion, that no such theory is likely to be successful. More detailed discussions of particular forms of justice can be found in other entries. See especially distributive justice, global justice, intergenerational justice, international distributive justice, justice and bad luck, justice as a virtue, and retributive justice. Section 1. Justice. Mapping the concept. Justice has sometimes been used in a way that makes it virtually indistinguishable from rightness in general. Aristotle, for example, distinguished between universal justice that corresponded to virtue as a whole and particular justice, which has a narrower scope. The wide sense may have been more evident in classical Greek than in modern English, but Aristotle also noted that when justice was identified with complete virtue, this was always in relation to another person. In other words, if justice is to be identified with morality as such, it must be morality in the sense of what we owe to each other. But it is anyway questionable whether justice should be understood so widely. At the level of individual ethics, justice is often contrasted with charity on the one hand and mercy on the other. And these, too, are other regarding virtues. At the level of public policy, reasons of justice are distinct from, and often compete with, reasons of other kind. For example, economic efficiency or environmental value. As this article will endeavor to show, justice takes on different meanings in different practical contexts. And to understand it fully, we have to grapple with this diversity. But it is nevertheless worth asking whether we find a core concept that runs through all these various uses or whether it is better regarded as a family resemblance idea according to which different combinations of features are expected to appear on each occasion of use. The most plausible candidate for a core definition comes from the Institutes of Justinian a codification of Roman law from the 6th century AD, where justice is defined as 
the constant and perpetual will to render to each his due. This is, of course, quite abstract until further specified, but it does throw light upon four important aspects of justice. 1.1. Justice and Individual Claims First, it shows that justice has to do with how individual people are treated, to each his due. Issues of justice arise in circumstances in which people can advance claims to freedom, opportunities, resources, and so forth that are potentially conflicting, and we appeal to justice to resolve such conflicts by determining what each person is properly entitled to have. In contrast, where people's interests converge and the decision to be taken is about the best way to pursue some common purpose, think of a government official having to decide how much food to stockpile as insurance against some future emergency, justice gives way to other values. In other cases, there may be no reason to appeal to justice because resources are so plentiful that we do not need to worry about allotting shares to individuals. Hume pointed out, that in a hypothetical state of abundance, every individual finds himself fully provided with whatever his most voracious appetites can want, the cautious, jealous virtue of justice would never once have been dreamed of. Hume also believed, and philosophical controversies on this point persist until today, that justice has no place in close personal relationships, such as the family, where it is alleged, each identifies with the other's interests so strongly that there is no need and no reason for anyone to make claims of personal entitlement. That justice is a matter of how each separate person is treated appears to create problems for theories such as utilitarianism that judge actions and policies on the basis of their overall consequences aggregated across people, assuming that these theories wish to incorporate, rather than discard, the idea of justice. In section 4 below, we examine how utilitarians have attempted to respond to this challenge. Although justice is centrally a matter of how individuals are treated, it is also possible to speak of justice for groups. For example, when the state is allocating resources between different categories of citizens. Here, each group is being treated as though it were a separate individual for purposes of the allocation. 1.2 Justice, Charity, and Enforceable Obligation Second, Justinian's definition underlines that just treatment is something due to each person. In other words, that justice is a matter of claims that can be rightfully made against the agent dispensing justice, whether a person or an institution. Here there is a contrast with other virtues. We demand justice but we beg for charity or forgiveness. This also means that justice is a matter of obligation for the agent dispensing it, and that the agent wrongs the recipient if the latter is denied what is due to her. It is a characteristic mark of justice that the obligations it creates should be enforceable. We can be made to deliver what is due to others as a matter of justice either by recipients themselves or by third parties. However, it overstates the position to make the enforceability of its requirements a defining feature of justice. On the one hand, there are some claims of justice that seem not to be enforceable by anyone. When we dispense gifts to our children or our friends, we ought to treat each recipient fairly, but neither the beneficiaries themselves nor anyone else can rightfully force the giver to do so. On the other hand, in cases of extreme emergency, it may sometimes be justifiable to force people to do more than justice requires them to do. There may exist enforceable duties of humanity, but these are rare exceptions. The obligatory nature of justice generally goes hand in hand with enforceability. 1.3. Justice and Impartiality The third aspect of justice to which Justinian's definition draws our attention is the connection between justice and the impartial and consistent application of rules. That is, what the constant and perpetual will part of the definition conveys. 
Justice is the opposite of arbitrariness. It requires that where two cases are relevantly alike, they should be treated in the same way. We discuss below the special case of justice and lotteries. Following a rule that specifies what is due to a person who has features X, Y, Z, whenever such a person is encountered ensures this. And although the rule need not be unchangeable, perpetual in the literal sense, it must be relatively stable. This explains why justice is exemplified in the rule of law, where laws are understood as general rules impartially applied over time. Outside of the law itself, individuals and institutions that want to behave justly must mimic the law in certain ways. For instance, gathering reliable information about individual claimants allowing for appeals against decisions. 1.4. Justice and Agency Finally, the definition reminds us that justice requires an agent whose will alters the circumstances of its objects. The agent might be an individual person, or it might be a group of people, or an institution such as the state. So we cannot, except metaphorically, describe as unjust states of affairs that no agent has contributed to bringing about. Unless we think there is a divine being who has ordered the universe in such a way that every outcome is a manifestation of his will. Admittedly, we are tempted to make judgments of what is sometimes called cosmic injustice, say when a talented person's life is cut cruelly short by cancer, or our favorite football team is eliminated from the competition by a freak goal. But this is a temptation we should resist. To say that for injustice, or injustice to occur, there must be some agent who has acted in a certain way, or produced some outcome, is less restrictive than might at first appear. For agents can create justice by omission. It is not unjust, though it is undoubtedly regrettable, that some children are born with a cleft lip. But it may well be unjust, once remedial surgery becomes feasible, to deny this to children whose lives would otherwise be blighted by the condition.